This is a Sky at Night special about Earth satellites. Now look up into a clear night sky, and you'll see stars and any planets that are around. But you'll also see much fainter things, tiny star-like objects generally moving slowly. Now these may look like stars, but they're not. They are man-made moons, put up there for various reasons. The first of them went up in 1957, and by now there are a great many. Now I'm delighted now to welcome Professor Mike Lockwood, Chief Space Scientist of the Rutherford Apple Laboratories. Hello Mike, there. welcome to the sky at night. First of all, many satellites. How many are up there now? How many are up there now? Well, it depends a little bit how you count. Yeah. If you count everything that's flying around, estimates are probably around 25,000. Uh, how many of these are active? Ah, uh, that's hard to work out because not everybody tells you when they've closed a yeah, spacecraft yeah. down, but probably around 800 in total. And guess. what are they doing mainly? There are Earth observation, communications, and of course scientific ones, astronomical, viewing the sun and uh, objects beyond. What heights are we talking about, about the Earth? The lowest ones are about 300 kilometres up, and from 300 up to about 1,000, we call that low Earth orbit. And they move around the Earth about once every 90 minutes or so, depending on their, their, their altitude, whizzing along at about 7.5 kilometres a second. But then you can go up in altitude, and uh, one of the famous uh, orbits is what we call geostationary orbit, at an altitude of 36,000 kilometres, which is 6.5, 6.6 Earth radii away from the Earth. And there, the period is 24 hours. And, of course, that's incredibly useful because you can view the same part of the Earth, you can have your communication satellite in the same position all the time. But there are some very special orbits, are there not? There are, yes. Uh, they come from an Italian-French scientist called Lagrange. Yeah. And the Lagrange L1 point is between the Earth and the Sun, and it's where the Earth's and the Sun's gravity balance out. And it's very useful for viewing the Sun and for viewing material coming out of the Sun. What about the, uh, the so-called L2 point? The L2 point's the other side of the Earth. It's the, on, the, on the night side of the Earth. And what happens there is that you orbit the Sun but if you were further away from the, the Sun than the Earth, you ought to be going a little bit slower. But the gravity of the Earth can pull you along a bit and you can stay in station. But that's very useful for astronomical purposes because you can look away and you don't have radio noise from the Sun or things like that to interfere with your communications to the satellite. <clears throat> now, there are many bodies now going around the Earth, but they won't all stay there permanently, will they? No. All satellites naturally decline back down to Earth. So how long they stay there depends on how high up they are. So something that's low down will re-enter quite quickly. How high have they got to be to be safe? Well, you can um, have something in a stable orbit for several years for at 250 to 300 kilometres up. If you have something at 850 or so kilometres, it's going to take centuries to come down. So it all depends how high up you're prepared to put things. Well, I wonder what the next 50 years will bring. Meanwhile, there are... Plenty of satellites up there, and they can be seen. And out in my garden, we have Pete Lawrence and Chris Lindholt. Let's see if they've got any tonight. Well, Pete, I guess the first question is, how do you know it's a satellite you're seeing in the sky? What do they look like? OK, well, satellites look like dots. They look like stars which are just moving against the background sky. Some people get confused between satellites and meteors, for example. But meteors, meteors are just shooting stars. They're shooting stars, but they move across the sky very, very quickly and they're gone in a fraction of a second, whereas a satellite will tend to take several minutes to cross the sky. And, of course, there is another confusion between satellites and planes. People often see um, a plane moving across, the bright light from a plane. They go, oh, there's a satellite. But you can tell normally with the plane because you've got either the noise or you can see the other um, lights on the wing tips, for example. Yes, the flashing lights are a giveaway. And that's a real giveaway. Now, the ISS is the space station. That's and right. this is the thing that really impresses people, I think, to see something in the sky and know that there are human beings on it. So how do we go about finding the International Space Station? Well, because it's such a popular satellite, there are a lot of prediction sites available on the internet. I mean, we've got heavens above. And you put in your position there and you can go onto a page which will tell you when the ISS is going to pass. So how bright is constantly. it compared to the other 
uh, objects in the sky? It varies in brightness depending on how far away it is and what's actually happening on the ISS itself, how many antennae are unfolded, etc. But as a rough range, it's about mag 1 up to mag minus 4. So that's anything from what? Venus to some of the brightest stars? That's right. It's very noticeable. It's fairly, fairly bright. The biggest problem is it's moving across the sky relatively quickly and of course looking through a telescope you're magnifying the view and you're magnifying the speed so you've got to be quite nimble to actually be able to keep up with it with your telescope. Yes but you can see details on the space station and on the shuttle. That's it's right. Quite, it's quite stunning it's not like anything else in the sky. When the shuttle is going up for service missions of course you have a period where the shuttle is actually racing to catch up with the space station so you'll see the space station go across and then the shuttle following it afterwards and then the next time you see them they're actually closer together closer together and then they're joined and and you, we, you can actually see those with a telescope. You can see the, the shuttle attached to the space station, which is amazing. Well, that's the space station. Now, I think the next most famous class of satellite will be the Iridium flares, at least from an observer's point of view. What are they? Well, the Iridium constellation um, is a, a group of satellites which was put up there as a global communications network. Normally, they, they look like normal faint satellites crossing the they sky. They do. You can see them all the time. If they're not in the Earth's shadow and it's dark, you can actually see them like normal satellites. They're about magnitude 6 or 7, I think, normally. So it's normally. binocular range, so binocular you could use binoculars range, like that's these right. if you want to see them. But, but the satellites are special because they have an array of three antennae panels at 120 degrees at the bottom of them. And because they have these big flat panels, sometimes if they're in the, they're in the right position, they catch the sunlight and they flare. And that's what we call an iridium flare. And they can be intensely bright. I mean, you can get iridium flares up to, I think the brightest is about magnitude minus nine. Which so that's is, about as bright as a half moon, I would guess. That's right, but it's, it's an intense point, of course, whereas the moon is spread out, this is an intense point. And once you've seen an iridium flare, it's almost impossible to believe you've missed them, because they are absolutely fantastic. Now, the heavens above sight will give predictions on iridium flares, and it's actually quite a neat party trick. If you know one's happening and you happen to be at a party, you can point up at exactly the time it's going to happen, and the guests think you're doing magic, because this amazing flare will appear in the sky. Well, it just goes to show it's worth knowing what's up there, because if you go out on a clear night like tonight, you are going to see satellites. Absolutely, yeah. And when you see so many of them, it's strange to think it was just half a century ago that the first one went up there. When the Russians launched Sputnik 1 in 1957, it became the first man-made satellite and kick-started the space race. The benefits to countries of getting access to this new frontier were obvious, but reaching space has never been easy. Rocketry is also an expensive endeavour, and so collaboration quickly became the order of the day. The first joint mission, launched in 1962, was Ariel-1, an American satellite carrying British experiments designed to study the Earth's atmosphere. British scientists have been working alongside other space programmes ever since. Some of the earliest British satellites were designed and built by the Mullard Space Science Laboratory, Based incongruously in a country house outside Dorking, the laboratory has just marked 40 years of satellite development. Patrick went along to join the party. Well, um, here I am at MSSL, the Mallard Space Science Laboratories, and a very special occasion. Satellite work has been going on here for 40 years. It began with Aerial One, that long forgotten satellite, but not forgotten here. It all stems from that. And satellite work has gone on here steadily ever since for 40 years. Quite a party going on, as you can see. It's a lovely sight. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we know about the past history of MSSL. What are the current projects? Well, I mean, we've recently been, uh, had the successful launch of Hinode, which is a solar mission, and um, that's been proving very successful yes. indeed. In the future, we have Herschel, which is an infrared astronomy satellite that's going to be launched by the European Space Agency next year, and we're very excited by that as well. More downstream, we're working on Gaia, and I think Gaia is an absolutely spectacular mission, looking at 
plotting the positions and accurately of millions and millions of stars in the galaxy so that we can actually trace the origin of the galaxy, how it was formed, how it merged with other galaxies and really explode the subject of galactic dynamics. And progress now is absolutely spectacular, isn't it? It is. We are in a golden age of yeah. astrophysics, absolutely. Of course, one thing I think is important to bear in mind, I mean, British technology has been involved in all these satellites. Absolutely, yes. In the years gone by, we would build instruments and fly them ourselves. Today, we work very closely with industry, providing the link between the science objectives and the technology itself. While the university departments like MSSL may design or even build parts of satellites, most are assembled by large aerospace companies such as Astrium, based here in Stevenage. It was on this site that in the 1950s Britain's Blue Streak rockets were built and tested. Today, the building is used for the design and construction of satellites, including those for communication, for military applications, and even those of interest to scientists, like Maggie Adirin. So, Maggie, you're an astronomer. What are you doing working in a satellite company? Well, I love astronomy, and that is sort of where I started. But um, I make instrumentation, and instrumentation can be used in astronomy for ground based but also up in space. So, uh, one of the satellites I'm working on at the moment is the James Webb Space Telescope, replacement for Hubble, probably going up about 2013, and that will give us a whole new vista on space. So we're standing in front of a satellite, and this is, well, I guess, a prototype for LISA. Yes. So LISA itself will be three satellites orbiting in space, picking up gravitational waves. Uh, LISA Pathfinder is effectively the pathfinder for that mission, uh, sending up a single satellite to uh, effectively do a recce and test the technology. But there's our planet as well. We can look at the Earth with satellites. Yes, and I'm working on a satellite looking at that directly, and that's due to be launched fairly soon. And that's Aeolus. What is Aeolus? Aeolus was actually the Greek keeper of the winds, <laughs> so that's the historical content, but it will actually measure wind speeds in the atmosphere. Presumably you could go in an aircraft and measure wind speed directly, why do you need to be up above it all? You can, but the problem is, um, that's one of the real benefits of satellites, they're out there and they're up there for a long time, and with Aeolus, UV lasers pulse into the atmosphere, uh, that light is scattered off particles in the atmosphere, and from the tiny movement of the colour of the light scattered off the particles, you can see how those particles are moving, and so you get a 3D image of the wind. So it's kind of radar, but with UV light? Yes, sort of radio so waves. LIDAR. LIDAR, <laughs> yes. OK, there you go. Yeah. How long have you been working on Aeolus? How long does it take to get this mission up in space? We were working on a small unit called the detector front end mm -hmm. and um, quite a critical part because that's what receives the photons of light um, after they've been gathered back up from the particles and um, I've been working on that for uh, I think over, over four years. And how long from that moment when I come to you with the money and say build me this to getting Aeolus up there and flying? It can vary on, depending on the complexity of the, um, uh, of the mission but I, I think um, usually it's of the order of uh, eight to ten years I'd say. So it's a long time. It is. Each of the many satellites which Astrium are working on at any one time is worth many millions of pounds, and a single contaminating particle of dust could lead to disaster. Great care has to be taken at each stage of the process, so we have to get into our own clean room gear before we can meet Aeolus in person. Here we are. It's a huge space, isn't it? Is it is vast, and sometimes we work on multiple missions in the same area. Mm, just the door gives you an idea of how big a spacecraft you can Because they've got in. to get these sort of things in. Yeah, and this is it? Yes. Well, I know this is Aeolus, but right. what are you doing? I okay, can see well, at, deep at, into its yeah. guts. Right at the moment, we're just preparing to start some official testing, which we've been doing for the last couple of days. Sure, so you, um, these pieces have been assembled all over that's Europe, right. I guess. So, end of July, we received the spacecraft from Astrium Germany, along with all of the support equipment you see over there. Okay. We are basically now integrating all of the elements, and on top of this platform will fit the instrument, okay. which, including the laser, which, will, which is the uh, measurement part of the uh, mission. And there's the solar panels to go on the as well? The solar panels will go on the side, and uh, that will happen much later in the year, next year. Well, it's great to see it here, but I know you want to talk about your piece, the detector front end, so let's go and have a look. Lovely. And here it is. Yeah, this is um, uh, my team's baby, although I must confess this is a model of uh, um, what's actually uh, in Aeolus. OK, so what are we looking at? So I think the most critical part is um, this lens system here, mm -hmm. and that's what will gather the light. So the light is scattered uh, through the atmosphere from the particles, 
gathered by the telescope, fed through various optics, and then passes through here. So we have the optics at the front, and then clearly the electronics and the controls at the back. But the electronics bring a problem with them, don't yes. they? Yes, because just like your laptop computer, um, you can feel it generating heat as the electronics are working. Mm -hmm. But my laptop's got a fan on it. Well, there's no air, so having a fan isn't very useful. Right. So instead, we have to use other means of getting the heat out of the system. And they're not actually shown on this model, but we have heat pipes, and they take the heat from the electronics and route that heat to a radiator. And um, the whole of the panel of um, the Aeolus system we were just looking at is a big radiator. Just to get rid of all the heat generated yes. by the electronics. And that points out to deep space. Now, every satellite appears different. The shapes are all different and you never see one that looks quite the same. But there is a lot of reusing going on, isn't there? We have to do that. And um, Aeolus is quite exciting because we're using a similar um, sort of uh, chassis. Um, and we've used it uh, for um, Mars Express. We've used it for Venus Express. And now, of course, we're using it for an Earth mission. So it's three different planets, same sort of chassis. You're going to study the Earth's winds with this, but wouldn't it be great to do the rest? Oh, yes. Because taking this to somewhere like Mars, I must admit, Mars is one of my favourites. And the atmosphere there and, and the weather systems there are quite phenomenal. So to do an Aeolus sort of measurement there would be fantastic. Well, I hope you make it to Mars in the end. And <laughs> good so luck too. with the Aeolus. Thank you so much. <laughs> with a following wind, Aeolus should be ready for launch sometime in 2008, a decade after the project started. Such long timescales have been unavoidable until now, but a quiet British revolution is underway, constructing smaller satellites which are much cheaper to get into orbit. And here is a genuine microsatellite. Not very large, is it? Now, these have been pioneered by Sir Martin Sweeting. We're delighted to have him with us now. Welcome to the sky at night, Sir Martin. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. Can you please give us the background of nanosatellites? Well, it all started really back in the early 1980s when the first microcomputers emerged. Of course, it was at the time when satellites were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and most satellites were the size of a London bus. Our sort of idea was to shrink it down and go in the opposite direction and to produce these microsatellites, which are sort of the size of a domestic uh, television. Were they photographic or cosmic rays, or what were they doing? Well, the first microsatellites really focused on providing uh, what we call then digital store and forward communications. It was rather like an email service. And it was before the internet took off and uh, it was providing uh, communications to very remote regions of the Earth where you could have a small radio, you could send your message up to the satellite, the satellite orbited the Earth, and a bit like a postman, it dropped it off at the destination. What about this one? Well, this is a, uh, a typical nanosatellite. It weighs about six kilos. You can see it's a sort of the size of a beach ball. Um, this is, the satellite is actually in its underclothes at the moment. It doesn't have any solar cells on and things like this, so it's a bit sort of naked. But uh, the satellite, uh, although it's very tiny, has all the functions of, that you would see in a normal satellite. It has propulsion, it has communications, computers. It even has a little GPS uh, uh, receiver which allows it to know where it is. And this satellite was launched uh, alongside one of our other uh, microsatellites. And the two satellites were placed into the same orbit. And this small nanosatellite, its first job was to image the parent satellite which it was launched with, which was a Russian satellite. And so we, the satellite orientated itself and took a picture of this uh, Russian satellite in orbit. And then after that, it chased after another microsatellite using the onboard propulsion and GPS, and then attempted to rendezvous with it and image it in, uh, in orbit. So it was a sort of an inspection satellite, one of the very early ones. What other uses do they have? Well, uh, after the, the, the communications, the sort of digital communications of the early 90s, we then started to use some of the technologies that were being developed for uh, digital cameras and to put those on the spacecraft and use the cameras for imaging the Earth looking at agriculture, looking at disasters, uh, looking at uh, um, you know, infrastructure on the, on the ground and so forth. How small can you go? Well, <laughs> as I say, the microsatellite's about the size of a, you know, a, a domestic television, the nanosatellite's the size of a beach ball, and now we're working on things called pico-satellites, really tiny satellites the size of a Coke can. And actually, we're even working on things that are a bit smaller than that, right the way down to the size of a, what we call a satellite on a chip. So we will end up with a, uh, all the satellite's functions on something the size of, say, of a credit card. What about launching? Can they launch themselves? 
Well, no, like we have a rock, to, like we, like rockets. Yeah, we still have to have rockets in order to get them up into orbit. So, um, most recently, what we've been using is a number of the decommissioned intercontinental ballistic missiles from the former Soviet Union, now Russian states and Ukraine. We're reprogramming them so they go up and keep going up into orbit rather than come back down again, as it was their original intention. Um, and instead of carrying warheads, now they carry satellites. Um, because the satellites are small and relatively low cost, we can afford to launch a series of them. Then these go round in orbit following each other in a constellation. And that means that we can take images anywhere on the Earth's surface very rapidly within a day. And that allows us, if there's a disaster somewhere, um, for example, like the Katrina uh, hurricane, we can then uh, task one of the satellites to get an image and then send it back. I mean, a very good example was the uh, Indian tsunami where we were imaged the whole of the Indian basin and then we used that to derive maps to then send to the aid agencies so they could send the right aid to the right places. So Earth Observation Constellations is, is what we're doing at the moment. One thing that interests me particularly, I hear rumours you may be planning to send some of these satellites to the moon. Well, yes, you're right. And actually this has been a, a bit of a dream of mine for ever since starting and watching the Apollo era yes. at the beginning. What do you propose to do when you get to the moon? Well, we're first of all going to carry some experiments for communications, but importantly, we're going to carry a number of high-speed penetrators. Or yes. And these darts will be released from the mothership that's orbiting the moon and come down and impact the lunar surface at quite high speeds, at about 300 metres per how, second. How deep will they go? Well, depending on which bit they hit, and assuming it's not a rock, <laughs> then they will go probably five or six metres into the lunar surface. And then they will carry some instruments to look at uh, um, lunar earthquakes or lunar quakes um, to measure the heat flow of the lunar surface. And so these will be sent to various regions of the, of the moon surface, which have not been uh, previously visited right. by Apollo. Thank you very much. Let's now join Chris at the SSDL, the home of the microsatellites at the University of Surrey. When you think of satellites, Mission Control in Houston, Texas, or California's Jet Propulsion Laboratory immediately spring to mind. The home of SSTL satellites isn't quite so exotic. Welcome to Mission Control in Guildford. From here, the fleet of satellites operated by Surrey Satellite Technology are controlled, and this is also where their data is first analysed. Well, we're standing in mission control. The signal's coming down from six satellites that are working now, and we can see their positions on the screen behind us. The, the, the map's actually showing, it's a, it's a rendering of where the spacecraft are uh, on the sphere of the, of the Earth. So they're in, they're in low Earth orbits. They're all between about six and 700 kilometers uh, orbit altitude. They're going around at about one and a half to two hours. Is, is For the one orbit. orbit. Yeah, correct. Um, and most of these are technology demonstration missions, so they're, they're testing out technologies, perhaps new technologies or new ways of, of applying the technology uh, into this particular uh, environment. Well, let's take one example. There's the DMC. What's that satellite doing? Well, that's the UK DMC satellite, the Disaster Monitoring Constellation Satellite. Uh, that's part of a, um, a constellation of five or seven spacecraft, uh, imaging disasters predominantly in the equatorial region uh, around the Earth. So that will be imaging uh, famines and, dr and droughts, um, damage of all kind, perhaps weather-related damage, anywhere on Earth. And because they fly around the Earth every couple of hours, it isn't very long before they can get to your, your region of interest and image it and get the image back rapidly to the people that can, that can make a difference. But also you get the global context. If you flew, um, for example, an imager on, a, on an aircraft, it would, it would miss the, uh, the global context of, of that area. A spacecraft in low Earth orbit could image the whole of the UK in one go. The satellites here at SSTL aren't multi-million pound monsters, but it's still important to keep them clean. Their latest cluster, or constellation, of Earth observation satellites are almost ready to fly. What we're looking at here is a constellation of low Earth orbiting uh, spacecraft being manufactured um, in the clean room. Uh, here's, here's one example here. This will be in an orbit altitude of about six or 700 kilometres, uh, and it will be uh, continuously flying around the Earth, imaging the Earth's surface, predominantly in, in, in Europe, uh, where customers are interested in, in, in looking at uh, crop usage. That looks a small solar panel to me. Do you, how much power would that produce? Well, over the spacecraft surfaces, there are, there are solar panels on several different surfaces. It'll produce about 100 watts of orbit, orbit average power. Okay. Which doesn't sound like much, but it's enough to power the various subsystems on board, the computers, the transmitters and so on. 
Okay, well, that's the solar panels, but let's move on to one without the solar panels. And what else can we see here? It's obviously a complicated piece of equipment. Yeah, I mean, here, this is a good, a good example you actually see right inside the spacecraft. You've got propulsion tanks here. These would store uh, cold gas, which is used by the propulsion system uh, to actually maneuver the spacecraft um, uh, changes position and so on. Uh, we've got a star imager up here which gives the attitude of the spacecraft. It stares at the, at the background of the stars. And that's for navigation? Presumably. That's for navigation and position, if you like, orientation. Um, and from that it can work out uh, where the Earth is, where it's got a point. And obviously we're making use of commercial off-the-shelf technology, uh, camera phones, camera electronics, laptop electronics. Some of the boxes on here are actually making use of this, these equipment on circuit boards. So you can see it's fairly compact, fairly small, but functionally very, uh, very complex. So how do these satellites fit into the scale of other things that you, you build here? They're probably midway through the range, I guess. It probably fits neatly in the middle of a 6.5 kilo nanosat, which is our smallest spacecraft. Mm -hmm. The shoebox size. The shoebox size, yeah, up to the 660 kilo spacecraft, which is very, very much larger. These satellites will soon join their thousands of cousins above us. With satellites becoming smaller and cheaper all the time, there will soon be many more for us to watch. Well, it's still a lovely night here in Celsi. Uh, we've been doing satellite watching, and we've seen quite a number. But one thing does strike me, Matt. Plenty of satellites up there now, and also plenty of assorted debris. This is becoming a nuisance. Yes, indeed, and it became a lot more of a nuisance earlier this year. Since the start of the space age, the amount of junk flying around up there had, uh, had grown. But we'd actually put a cap on it. We'd actually got a hold of it with methods to... We thought about the end of life of spacecraft and what we'd do with them when, they were, when we were finished with them. And then came China. Yes, earlier this year, January, the Chinese did a Star Wars-style test on, a, on a, an old weather satellite. Now, the Americans have done this before, but they use quite low-altitude satellites that the bits burnt up quite quickly. But this Chinese satellite was up at 850 kilometres, which is technically a great feat, and strategically it's very important. But um, in terms of the space debris, it's a disaster. Um, 20,000 fragments. How big are the bits? All between about two centimetres and two metres. So the bits we're monitoring, there are probably a few bigger chunks than that as well. Um, and it adds up to about 50% more junk that's uh, been put up there in space. And it's going to stay there a long time. Um, we estimate that in 100 years' time, 80% of it will still be there. That'll really be a danger to future satellites. One would worry a lot about for the shuttle, for example, once it's spread all over the globe. Uh, you have to remember a shard of paint hitting the, uh, the windscreen of the shuttle will shatter it. And what can I do about it? Not a lot. Now it's done, no. Uh, I mean, we have to make sure nobody does this again. Um, but uh, now it's done. There's not, we just have to live with it now, yes. One day, I suppose there may be a major disaster from one of these problems, but let's hope not. Uh, we have to make sure not. Well, there are plenty up there. Well, Chris and Peter have been satellite watching. Um, have you seen any more? Well, we've seen a few, but Pete, where in the sky should I be looking to have the best chance of seeing something? Well, satellites can be seen anywhere in the sky at all. I mean, they just catch the sun's light and then reflect it back, and then you see them as dots moving across the sky. But to see that, you've got to have the sunlight on them in the first place. And we've got to be in darkness. And we've got to be in darkness. But the truth is, if you're out on a night like tonight, it's clear you look up, you're going to see satellites. You there will. are so many of them up there. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, Chris, Pete, Mike, thank you very much. Well, it's still a lovely evening down here. Up in the sky now, there are thousands of satellites going round us. And you know, when I began doing the sky at night 50 years ago, there were none at all. Times have changed. Good night. Mm -hmm.